Is now. Um, so please welcome Dr. Alina Moore. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we've gone from America to the UK and home to Ireland. I feel a little bit of a fraud standing here in front of you because I am not by any means an epilepsy expert. Um, but I have um, worked in the epilepsy world for many years now and I'm very lucky to work with Catherine here in Kerry who supports me in the clinic and will know a lot of um, you here um, and um, works very um, expertly um, to provide us with the service um, in constrained circumstances. So I've been given a really very big challenge Everybody else has defined times. Um, childhood is not to 12. Um, adolescence, well, arguably, um, 13 to 19. And I have the rest um, in 40 minutes. Um, so we have a whistle-stop tour from um, 18 to death. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to touch on some of the major topics as we go along. So just a little overview of what I'd like to talk to you about today. The diagnosis of epilepsy in adulthood, which is a much bigger challenge often than the diagnosis of epilepsy when you're a child or a teenager, because as our other speakers have said, when you're an adult, you're very often on your own. You don't have mammy and daddy with you to support you when the diagnosis is made. And it also carries great implications probably for your future or what you perceive as your future. It can have implications for your employment um, and it can be a very difficult time. Um, education and employment obviously are affected um, in adulthood. We also have to talk a little bit about sexuality and particularly about pregnancy. And Sophia has already broached the subject of sudden, un sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, but it is something that one has to talk to people about and for people to be aware of, but again, not to be frightened by. So seizures in adulthood. I'm not really going to talk about pre-existing seizure disorder because that's been very well covered by my two previous colleagues, but I'd like to talk about adults who get their first seizure as an adult. When people come to the clinic, the first thing they ask is, yes, so I've had a seizure, am I going to have another one? Um, should I be treated because I've had a seizure? Is it better that I take tablets now even though I only have one seizure? Or should I wait until I have had a second seizure? Um, these are difficult questions to answer. In a lot of cases, there isn't a clear answer. Um, it's a discussion between the person who's had the first seizure and their treating doctor. Different people have different reasons for wanting to go on medication early. Other people might want to wait until they have a second seizure. It depends on the individual person's perception of risk or how they see how epilepsy, if it's going to be epilepsy, will interfere with their lives. So what is the risk of recurrence? Well, the things that I can do to help a person decide if they are likely to have another seizure are first of all, scan them. If there is evidence that there's an abnormality on the scan, then your risk of having another seizure is definitely increased. If there has been a history of a previous brain insult or a brain injury, so what do I mean by that? So for example, if somebody had an episode of um, encephalitis, and they may have an increased risk of having seizures. If somebody had an abnormality on their brain scan, something like Sophia was talking about um, earlier, where someone has an abnormality which has no functional problem to the patient, but has, um, interrupts how their brain functions, um, then that um, increases the risk of seizure. And if we do a brainwave test, and that shows that the person has um, abnormal brain waves on it, that can predict um, a risk of having a second seizure. There are other things that cause seizures that don't increase your risk of having another seizure. So for example, if somebody has a convulsive syncope, what do I mean by that? Somebody who um, has a faint and because helpful people keep them sitting up when they have a faint, they have jerking movements and then a witness comes and tells you that they've had a seizure. Um, if someone has a head injury, um, sometimes you see it in football matches where someone there's a clash of heads and you see abnormal jerking and um, people describe that as a seizure, but we consider that to be um, a head injury seizure. 
or if someone has surgery and if someone had a, um, a bleed to their brain and they had an operation, they may have a seizure after that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they will go on to have more seizures. And occasionally women who are pregnant can have eclampsia and have seizures as a consequence of that. If you are an adult and you're already driving and you have a seizure, whether it's one seizure or ten seizures, it has an implication for you driving. And this, particularly when you live in rural Ireland, has a huge impact on your life. Um, telling patients that they've had a seizure, um, who've had a seizure and already have to deal with the shock of having had a seizure, that they cannot drive for 12 months, um, is very difficult. Um, it um, has implications for their jobs, it has implications for bringing their children to school, um, but it is um, the law and most people recognise the reason for it um, because we know that in the first 12 months after a first seizure there's a between 40 and 50% risk of having a second. There are exceptions which are important to recognise that if the seizure only occurs at night for the previous 12 months and sometimes that can be a challenge because the person comes to clinic having looked up the driving regulations and they say, oh, my seizure happened at night, therefore I can drive. And you have to be able to say, well, sorry, if your seizures had always happened at night or if they had happened at night for the previous 12 months, then I can say your risk of having a seizure during the day is very small. Um, but if you've only had your first seizure and your first seizure happened at night, in actual fact, your risk of having a second seizure is quite high. And as Sophie already mentioned, if you're seizure free and on treatment, um, then, there's, then you are free to drive. There is a problem with people who are heavy goods vehicle drivers. You have to be 10 years seizure free and off all medication. And obviously that has implications for the young man who has been in the childhood services, now is in the adult services and really, really wants to be um, a heavy goods vehicle driver. Um, again, um, we can make the attempt to come off medication and see um, how, how things will happen, um, but it is um, of itself um, a restriction. The other recent change to the law which has caused implications for patients is that now if you're withdrawing from medication, you're not allowed to drive while you withdraw and you're also not allowed to drive for a further six months. This can actually quite... Um, influence whether a person decides to go on medication or not. So, for example, somebody comes in and has their first seizure and after discussion I say your risk of having another seizure in the next 12 months is probably about 40% and they decide, okay, I'm going to see and wait if I get a second seizure. I always explain that even if you get your second seizure on day 364, it means you now have to clock up another year again. Um, the person may decide not to go on medication. I often see that there's a very clear sex divide in this. Women, because they're often conscious that they will potentially have a baby, will decide not to go on medication. Men, because they don't want to risk the driving any longer than they have to, will often opt to go on medication. But where the problem may arise is where a young person decides to go on medication and then is five years seizure free, um, comes to have a chat about having a baby and I say you're, it's marvellous, you're five years seizure free, we can certainly withdraw you from medication, your risk of recurrent seizure is very low but actually you're not going to be able to drive while you're withdrawing from medication and it probably will work out for about a, about a year. Very often that influences the person negatively and they don't want to withdraw from medication. So in choosing drugs um, and recommending drugs very often that conversation has to happen um, before you just put the person on medication just because, because they may not be able to withdraw from it because they want to drive. So in treating a first seizure, um, all of the literature now would suggest if you have one seizure that isn't provoked, there's a risk of recurrence is about 35%. So if one treats just a first seizure, um, without any backup information, without an MRI scan or without an EEG, there are 65% of people who might not need medication. But that's me wearing my doctor's hat saying they might not need medication. For the person who's had the seizure, they may say, well, I don't want to run the risk of having another seizure. 
I would prefer to be on medication than have another seizure. There's no promise that when you go on medication you won't have another seizure, but they want to have the security of the risk reduction. It may be that they live um, in a very remote area and they don't want to run the risk of having a second seizure on day 364, um, having already exhausted all the goodwill of their neighbours um, and also um, want to be able to drive for either social reasons or because um, of work reasons. Um, and that then, as the doctor, one has to talk to you and say, well, what do you want to do? And then in doing that, try and choose the drug that is going to fit best into your circumstance. So, for example, if you are a young woman who will potentially get pregnant in the future, choose a drug that will work well for you. Um, if you are um, a young man who might be only good at taking tablets once a day, that you'll choose a tablet that is only prescribed once a day. Um, or if you are, for example, somebody who has weight challenges, that you're not going to choose a drug that will increase your appetite and put on weight. Um, so these are conversations that happen um, between two adults, which I suppose in a way is different to what happens between um, your paediatric neurologist and a child. Um, very often it's the parents that make the decision until the children um, have a vote. Is there a benefit to immediate as opposed to um, delayed treatment? Statistically, there isn't. And so statistically, whether you treat somebody after their first seizure or second seizure or third seizure, if you're making that decision to treat, there isn't a huge difference in the prognosis. But there could be a huge difference in real life. Um, in the elderly patient, so the person who's over 60, um, if they have a seizure and they can't drive for a year, um, it becomes increasingly intimidating to go back on the road. Um, I know myself, for someone who has lived and worked in the UK and drove through London without any great difficulties, um, I'm challenged in Dublin now because I'm used to driving around Kerry, though driving in Kerry has its challenges. <laughs> Indicators are optional extras. Um, but if you're elderly and you can't drive for a year, it can be quite intimidating to go back again. Equally, we know that in the elderly person, if they have a seizure and fall and fracture their hip, um, the mortality from a fractured hip um, is actually greater than if you develop breast cancer after the age of 55. So, in treating older patients, the threshold for putting patients on, tre on treatment um, is actually lower than in younger people because of the implications both health-wise health and socially um, of the impact of having a second seizure in their world. There's a long list of anticonvulsants and the list grows um, and the side effects and benefits of each um, are different. But it is wonderful to have a long list because it does mean that if one doesn't suit you that there is potentially another. Um, and from my point of view as an adult neurologist, it's a challenge to keep up with each of them and which one works with which and which combination is best. And as you can see, it grows ever longer. However, in choosing any of these drugs, there are things that we have to think about. So for women, we have to think about fertility and sexual function. Um, we have to be aware of polycystic ovaries, have to be aware that we know that sodium valproate could have implications on this, um, and take that into consideration in prescribing. Women with epilepsy have a lot more challenges than men with epilepsy because we're different. Um, and so there's the challenges about sexuality, there's a lot of talk about seizures happening around the time of periods, and those of you who know me well um, will say that I want to know that it happens on exactly the same day of every menstrual cycle um, for me to be absolutely convinced. Contraception is an issue. Um, it's an issue that isn't always um, managed as well as it should be. Pregnancy and, of course, menopause. With contraception, one has to be aware that liver enzyme-inducing drugs will reduce the efficiency of the oral contraceptive pill. Um, and it is surprising how many of our GP colleagues um, still think that if you double the dose of the pill, 
and you're on an anticonvulsant drug that you're providing effective contraception. Um, this is something that I regularly talk to GPs about, but it's something that you as patients need to be aware of yourselves and challenge them on. The non-liver enzyme-inducing drugs and the oral contraceptive pill work well. The liver enzyme inducers are carbamazepine, which a lot of people are on, um, but what I, most people don't fully appreciate that is if you're on high-dose lamotrigine or high-dose topiramate, they too induce liver enzymes and can cause problems with contraception. As Sophia mentioned, um, talking to teenagers about becoming pregnant is very important. Um, and also mentioning it to adults that I much prefer that they will, we have the talk about becoming pregnant as opposed to them coming to the clinic pr already pregnant. Um, any of us who become pregnant, there's a risk of having an abnormal baby. Um, but if you're on anticonvulsant drugs, the risk increases. It doesn't increase monumentally. Um, and we can minimise the increase in risk, but the only way we can do that is by having the conversation. We need to choose the drug, um, choose it wisely, and if we have to choose a drug that is associated with abnormalities, that we choose it in the lowest possible dose. Um, high dose folic acid, as in five milligrams, should be prescribed, and at a recent meeting that I attended wearing a different hat, um, I was pleased to hear my consultant obstetrician colleague saying that when the pill is prescribed um, for anybody that five milligrams of folic acid should actually be prescribed with it. Um, high dose folic acid has been shown to reduce the risk of congenital abnormalities um, in, in many medical comorbid conditions. So for example in people who are overweight who are planning to get pregnant, um, high dose folic acid um, is very effective. As I've already said, we need to use the smallest amount of medication that we can um, and also be aware that levels reduce in pregnancy. Um, I work with my obstetric colleagues so that we're in communication when one of our patients with epilepsy is pregnant so that they are aware about supplementing vitamin K in the last trimester if that's what's necessary. That no, I am not a huge fan of drug levels, but certainly in pregnancy that one would be aware that levoracetam drops in the, lower tri in the last trimester so that we make adjustments to it for the last trimester, um, and that it's an active process as opposed to a passive process. It is still a little bit frightening to see um, that 28% of people who have seizure disorder who become pregnant are not on folic acid. I see that as a failure of communication from their doctors, that the message isn't out there. Um, and I know that Epilepsy Ireland promotes this. Um, and it's obviously, we are the educated people that are here today. It's capturing other people's um, thought process that's important. So in just mentioning briefly about pregnancy, that there are some anticonvulsant drugs um, that increase the risk of major congenital abnormalities that we do know that the amount of the drug that you're on is important and that probably it's best to be taking the slow release preparation drugs as opposed to the um, regular drugs. Um, this is an old paper now, but it confirmed to us what we had all already suspected. And recently, the makers of Valparate have issued a special warning about fetal Valparate syndrome and the now defined association with cognitive and behavioural problems for children who have been exposed to it in utero. So it is a drug that one tries to avoid in young women who are potentially becoming pregnant. But sometimes you can't avoid it. And if you can't, we minimise the amount of medication that the person is on um, and make sure that all preventative other comorbidities are managed. So in a young woman, choices of anticonvulsant at the moment, depending on the epilepsy syndrome, are still lamotrigine, levoracetam and carbamazepine. And at the moment, valparate and topiramate are best avoided, and if at all possible, to avoid combination therapy. I need to mention osteoporosis, which is the little bit I'm going to talk about under menopause, um, but also to be aware that men too can get osteoporosis. Um, phenytone, and there are still quite a few people on phenytone, um, and carbamazepine, and, and some people would suggest valparate, increase the risk of developing osteoporosis. 
And so we need to be aware of this and have osteoporosis screening um, earlier um, than we would do in people who don't take these medications. And osteoporosis screening in men um, happens very rarely. Um, and certainly from my clinic, I often get letters saying, why are you sending this man for a DEXA scan? Um, and having to explain that the drug that he's on increases his risk of osteoporosis. Talking then about education, I think it's important to be aware of the DARE program. Um, this is, if you like, an advantage to having um, a medical problem where you can get um, extra educational support as a consequence of having a chronic illness. Um, some of my patients have um, used this program and certainly the extra benefit that they've had to their points and their leaving cert have allowed them enter courses that they wouldn't otherwise have achieved. Just a little note as in f kind of supporting your treating neurologist, um, a lot of teenagers do leaving cert and this has to be in the DARE program uh, application form, has to be in with their CAO form which is about February. Um, I often um, do a lot of midnight oil work in February where I'll have 10 of these quite complicated forms to fill in for tomorrow. Um, we all know we're doing the Leaving Cert and filling in the CAO form um, a good 10 years in advance. Um, so it would be helpful to the neurologists that they were staggered, that maybe you got two or three of them a month as opposed to 14 or 15 of them at the end of the day. Also, and this is a challenge, you know, if you have a seizure disorder and you're doing your leaving cert and you have a seizure doing it, um, you may lose valuable time. Um, you may not be able to finish your paper. Um, if you've discussed this with the school principal in advance, um, you can do your leaving cert in a room on your own. You can have a scribe to support you. Um, and schools are very supportive of this. Again, the letter has to come from your treating neurologist. And around this time of the year is the time to do this because they have to employ extra people to support in a, um, in a room on your own, um, in an exam centre. Um, and so I would certainly advise you to do this. Um, and it gives um, the person doing their state exam um, an assistance. Equally, going to college, um, there are supports for people who have a seizure disorder and other neurological conditions in college. Um, but unless you ask for them, you won't get them. And again, a lot of young people don't want to be seen as different um, and want to be the same as everybody else. And I kind of spin it to them and suggest that, you know, you've had a trouble with having a chronic illness all the time you were in, in school and you've had to take medication where other people haven't. You know, this is your payback. You'll get an extra 10% in your exam. You'll be able to tell them that I couldn't finish my project. Um, because of my medication, where in actual fa fact um, you were out drinking cider under the bridge. <laughs> um, but, you know, sometimes um, you have to spin things to your own advantage. I think it's very interesting that if you look at um, people who have epilepsy, if they tell their employer that they have the condition. Um, and on looking at the literature, the estimate is that less than 50% of people tell the person that they're working for that they have seizures. I think we need to work on this because obviously it has implications for a person in the workplace if they have a seizure. And also we need to promote the fact that having epilepsy <coughs> should not discriminate. Very briefly, I'm mentioning sudden unexplained death in epilepsy. It's rare. There are a list of um, risk factors. And I think it is important, particularly in the young adult, that you talk them through these risk factors. Um, because as Sophia said, it's quite common when people go to university that they decide to stop taking their medication. Or they may challenge their medication. Um, stay out late, drink. Um, and I advise them to do one or the other. I say, please don't take on two risks. If you're going to go out late, don't drink. If you're going to have a few drinks, come home early. I'm sure they don't listen to me, but I feel better. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting that with um, sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, the back to sleep program has been suggested for people as well in the same way as to prevent cot death. And obviously something that probably as neurologists we haven't been very good at is checking to make sure that there isn't a cardiac abnormality 
um, on, um, in, in our patients. So, for example, when everyone has an EEG, there's a tracing of the ECG, which is the cardiac monitor um, on the bottom of it. I have to admit my heart sinks when Brian McNamara sends me back the result of an EEG saying the EEG is normal, but the ECG is very abnormal. Um, and I feel very silly that I've sent them off for an EEG in the first instance and then have to find a kind cardiologist to, to review the ECG. So in summary then, epilepsy in adulthood, um, it's a bit like being in the Boy Scouts. We have to be prepared for all the challenges that come with this diagnosis. I think the people that we tend to forget are the elderly who are diagnosed with the seizure disorder and the particular challenges it presents to their life. And like everything, knowing about the condition, knowing about the drugs, um, and knowing about the potential complications um, make dealing with the chronic illness much easier. Thank you.